Okay, so you can all see that my shape is changing over time. That's an example of a tween. Now for using a mask, let me delete the shape layer. Here's the image, scale it up. Now remember, if your image is selected when you use a, a tool, it's going to make a mask. So here's my first mask. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add another shape. I'll do a circle this time. So I've got two shapes and I'm gonna kind of try and want to get them lined up. When you're tweening and morphing, how your shapes line up is critical. Um, and this is an example of the data that's held in a keyframe in a mask, and I'm gonna show you that in a second. So I clicked the mask path for each of my mask shapes, and I'm gonna get this circle one. I'm just gonna select the mask for that, and hit copy, and I'm gonna delete that mask. And I'm gonna move my playhead forward a little bit, add a new keyframe, and paste that information inside this keyframe. And what you'll see is the mask shape will tween over time. Okay? And this is useful for when you're using effects that will not apply to shape layers. There's a lot of them out there. So for tweening shapes, it's gonna be through the paths and the points, but for masks, you're gonna do it through your keyframes. That's one example of that. Second, turn this over here. Okay, the next thing I wanna show you that's gonna be very useful, I'm going to put in a piece of video just that we can see this. This will apply also to animation, but speeding up and slowing things down is very critical to know when you're animating. Got that. Okay, let me up my resolution so you can see what's happening. All right, moment. And I'll reduce the number of particles just that they're gonna play faster. Alright. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you should see the finished result. Um, Alright, so here's a bunch of particles, and you can see I'm gonna let them stream through. Now, if I can't figure out how to slow these down, I can go time, time stretch. And if I make these, if I went 50, that made it twice as fast. So I'm going to make it 200 in the stretch factor. It's going to make it twice as slow. And already, once the screen refreshes, you'll see the particles start to slow down. In a moment, you'll see that. Yep, right here. So you can mess around with time to get different results. I'm going to undo that so it's back to 100%. And I'm going to show you a very useful uh, effect. Called Time Warp. And what this is going to do is I'm going to change my speed to 100. That's normal speed. And I'm going to put time up right here. Let me see if I turn it off. See, now my effect turns on and off. Okay, so I'm going to delete this. I'm going to pre-compose my particles. Because remember, I said the number one thing to troubleshoot is pre-compose. Okay, good. Now it's working. And... So again, the speed, 100 is normal speed, all right? So 
if I want, here's my particles coming out, but if I want them to slow down at a certain point, I don't want to have to figure out any math here, I click the stopwatch for speed. This is the point where it's going to start to slow down, and I'll go forward, and then I'll slow it down a lot. I'm going to hit the U key on my keyboard to show my keyframes, and let's say I want them at that speed for a little bit of time, so there's no change in between these. And then I add one more keyframe and send it back up to 100. And I'm going to ease these. That just that there's no the, uh, s smooth out. So I'm going to put a little bit here to change my render. And we'll see what that looks like in a second. And you'll see the refresh in a moment on your end because now my stream slowed down but it's only about 20 seconds behind so watch the particles you see them slow down and then speed back up again this time warp technique you see it in movies like uh, the matrix and 300 this is how it's done it's a matter of choosing the part where you want it to start to slow down move the playhead and change it. 100% is normal speed. If you go lower than that, it's gonna slow down. If you go faster than that, it's gonna speed up. And like I said, this is a really useful one for dialing in your animation. So you're probably gonna to wanna to practice time warp a lot. Just going through the slides here. Okay, now, does anyone have any questions about time stretch or time warp? Don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm guessing we're good there. Okay. So we're going to move into something a little more complex and I'm just going to start the beginning of it for tonight. And then I'm going to give you extra lab time to uh, ask questions and email me um, any questions you have. So I'm going to delete these particles and I'm going to use the pen tool. Sorry about that, just getting some water. Okay, so I'm going to just draw a shape here. Fine, that's one shape. And it's clicking here. You know what? No. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to make a letter A. And I'm going to convert it to a shape. And then I'm going to right click on that shape. Okay, I can tell this one's the inside and this one, I mean this one's the outside of the shape. This should be it. Yep, all right, that's what I was looking for. Okay, this one is, I'm gonna show you the beginning of this and then we'll end it. And then when I do Wednesday's class, we will go over this whole technique. So we'll go pretend that this is just a complex shape that was drawn. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna choose which point, like I'm picking this point right here at random. Right here, I just chose that one point on the path. 
with path selected, right clicked, and then choose set first vertex. And I'm gonna zoom out. And what that's gonna do when we start to morph shapes is that's gonna mark this as the point that we're going to be using to change from one shape to another. Or again, like you said, if you want, you can animate the path, but that's going to be a bit more tricky. So what I'm gonna do is for this, I'm just going to click here. Uh, we do a letter C just for the fun of it. Line them up. I'm gonna line them up off of near where that um, path point was. Now nah, I'm gonna center them. Nah, nah, I'm gonna do this instead. Now I'm gonna turn that into shapes. going to do is I'm going to select that one shape, that one path point light. But first I've got to open up my path. There we go. I'm going to choose this and I'm going to set this as the first vertex over there. I know you can't see that part on the pop-up, but I'm going to spell that out more in depth uh, Wednesday. So I'm going to use this keyframe that I've got. And I'm going to hide this. And I'm going to paste it right on this keyframe right here. And I'm now morphing these two shapes. And you can see all the motion coming from where I set that first vertex, the first vertex, uh, the vertice to keep them from like flying around all over the place and make it a little bit more successful and interesting. We're gonna go over this technique step-by-step -step Wednesday and it might take the entire lecture, but it's a very interesting, powerful thing learning how to morph shapes um, in After Effects. And remember, since I made these fonts a letter, uh, I made it a shape, that means I could apply effects to it, like rough and edges. Oops, I put on the wrong layer. That's funny. Let me delete that. It'll be right down here. And then we'll see it starting to work. Yep, see? that you could do lots of interesting things with your shapes as you morph them and it's all a matter of experimenting and we're going to be going over like I said this very deep in depth uh, you could put a displacement map over it that looked really nice as well so like I said this was just a loose introduction to the concept of tweening and morphing and Wednesday we're going to dive really deep into morphing but the uh, time warp, like I said, is really gonna help you with some of your animations to get them to be a bit more polished. Let me hop over to, let's see. There. Okay, and I have the student mail up in a second in the background. Close those slides. Oh, okay, so it was Jade uploaded some stuff from her character. I just didn't see it. One second. That's a good breakdown. So let me go to... Folders right over here. 
Okay, now I see it. All right, it's your character. Good, 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 good. And let me... Make a tab. Good, now I'm here. Now I can get to do the email. Here. Okay. Now we can back to Google Drive character. Oh fun. Okay. I downloaded this. Alright, yeah. It's letting me download. So let me see. Is Jade on? Okay, yeah. I'm going to import the character real fast. Oh, okay. This is the one I'm looking for right here. Perfect. I like how you have these layered out. Good job. And you'll see this in a moment. Okay, so... This is just an example. I'm using this um, from Jade's artwork. And if this were broken down into After Effects, you could isolate these different parts, like the calf would be a layer, the thigh would be a layer, and then you'd have to rig all this together. Um, it'd be like the foot is parented to the calf, the calf is parented to the thigh, the thigh is parented to the hip, and you work your way up and you want to get everything basically parented to the body. And you'll have a lot of control over your character. But another thing you can experiment with, and then you would just set all your anchor points up at the right spot. Like uh, the shoulder, the anchor point would be up here. For the elbow, your anchor point would be right there. Another thing you could do is you could puppet pin this. And remember, when you're puppet pinning, you want to pin down what you want to move as well as what you do not want to move. So I'm going to pin down the foot. Working. Okay, let's try and pre-compose this and see if that'll work. Because I didn't look at how this file was made. Okay, there we go. Yeah, the pre-comp worked. And basically, you know, I'll put the pins where the body moves. And the way puppet pinning works is once you've got your pins in, you move your playhead. And then you just click on one of the pins and you move it. This is actually right there. Very good. And you can move more than one pin at a time. But you'll see in a second as I move this character out, since it's not layered you're going to run into some distortions when you move some of the parts around. And you'll see when the screen refreshes, like the thighs of the character um, stretch out as it's puppeted. Oh, oh, you want to see something funny? Okay, I'm glad that helped. Let me do this. I'm going to get my puppet and I'm going to delete the puppet. I just realized something. You ready for this, Jade? 
So here's your character. I pre-composed it. Watch up here, show mash. I have the expansion set up way too high. I'm gonna lower my expansion and I'm gonna put some pins in now. Yeah, see this? This is way too much. I can knock that down. I had it set way too high. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start it with that. Okay, so clicking the show mesh, I should have done that before, but I was just rushing to show you puppet pinning. And what that's going to do is once I put my pin in, you see this mesh. Now, the density of the mesh, if I increase that, I'll have more folds, so there'll be less distortion and you can get some smoother uh, motion, but it'll slow down your render time. So it's juggling the density. Expansion, if I set that to zero. It'll be really tight around the character, but one thing you have to watch out for is you gotta make sure when you've got things like, say you had a pattern on these pants, you wanna make sure that the mesh goes completely off the character. And it's doing that now, so I'm not going to expand it. So now I'm going to go through, and I'm gonna add back in my pins. Because now that there's less of an expansion, your character should be pinned down a lot easier. So I'm going to try that out before I startle you and have to break down the whole character. But it's still good to break down the whole character because you can see the shoulder. Here's a little bit. So I just move my playhead and I move. See how it's not distorting the, the hips anymore? Because I lowered the expansion. So that's something you got to watch out for. The closer the keyframes are together, the faster the motion. And that's Papa Pinning in a nutshell. Um, see, that's actually looking pretty good. And another thing that really makes Puppet Pinning sing is, of course, easier keyframes. And if you need to change the speed graph on them. But I don't see your character distorting. Uh, wait, I missed a whole bunch of the chat while I was going over that one second. Um, okay. Uh, the one-eyed cat sounds better than a sandwich-eating monster, in my opinion. Ooh, ooh, I'm glad you said this. Okay, so, okay. So... Jay, did that help showing how to reduce the expansion so that your character doesn't get as distorted? I'm going to move my playhead a little bit more, and I'm going to shift the hips some, just to show as if she were moving a little bit. And you see it's not distorting the arms, it's just elongating the hips so a little bit yes okay good and like I said I'll walk you through anything you need with pup pinning and then I could just rotate the head a little bit Ta -da. And I know you did some pup pinning before with your last one but uh, like I said showing the mash will show you that you're getting your whole character covered in all the right spots expansion to make it larger if you need to and density will give you smoother, less jagged looking distortions when you move your character around. So what I would recommend, Jade, is probably breaking this down into several layers and animating it that way. And I'm going to do that real quick with uh, rounded rectangles. I'll make each one a different color. One second. We'll just say that this is the head, and I'm going to put my anchor point down here at the bottom. Like that, okay. And then my torso, blue. And I'll put my anchor point for my torso in the middle, I guess. Why not? No, no, I'll put it down here at the 
of the hips. Because if I wanted to bend or anything like that, it'd move from the hips. And then I'm just going to make legs real fast. And the anchor point for the leg will be at the top where it meets the thigh. And I've got all my edges rounded so that um, when I'm working more precisely, there will not be rough corners sticking out because you wouldn't see those in real life. Like the things in nature end up being smooth. And I'm just gonna put a foot down here real fast. that anchor point up to the top where it meets the leg and I do the same thing with the hand like the hand would be at the bottom then the uh, forearm then the shoulder but um, I don't want to waste everybody's time watching me rig an entire person Okay, and the neat thing about parenting is it's going to be in your switches, which you see here, as well as in your modes. So I'm going to parent the head to the torso, the thigh to the torso, the shin to the thigh, and then the foot to the shin. What this means is if I rotate my thigh, which you'll see, the calf will move with it as well as the foot, but everything above it stays still. And you'll see that once my screen refreshes, like it's doing right now. So I can independently move that and then I can go and I can rotate the shin independent of that, as well as the foot, like such. So each one of these can be independently rotated and they'll move along with what they're parented to. Okay, so this will help you with your character, Jade. And the torso, watch what happens when I move the torso. Everything moves with it because everything is parented to the torso. So if I rotate my torso, everything's going to rotate along with the torso. But I can also say I wanna move my head in a different direction, it'll move with it but I can rotate it in an opposite direction than the body's going because of this character rigging. So you start at, uh, I do the head to the torso, and then you move downward. Uh, the thigh to the torso, the shin to the thigh, the foot to the shin, and over here would be, the hand would be parented to the forearm, the forearm would be parented to the shoulder, and the shoulder would be parented to the torso. That's just a quick example of rigging up a character and the possibilities you can have with that. But a uh, really good design, really good design and colors on your character. I'm liking it so far, um, and I can help you break down the layers as need be. Okay, does anyone else have any questions or want some help setting up their files while we're here? Just testing because I refreshed my browser here. All right. 
make sure that's working. Okay, yes, please get a start on that because the semester is passing us by. Storyboarding is crucial. Um, even before you storyboard up your ideas, you can do what's called like uh, a shot list where you could say, I'm thinking of doing this. You could just write up your thought and getting that to me, I can help you break down your ideas. Um, let me see, Jack's question. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt, Jack. Just write my teacher email and we can work out a time um, because I am working from home and uh, if you want, I could share my screen. You know, now that it's working, I've worked out all the bugs after this update. I could share my screen and show you the ideas and you could write me and send me images of your thoughts. You don't have to be on camera. You don't need to be. You could send screenshots. Um, most importantly, if you send me samples of what you want, like um, say you find something on YouTube and you're like, oh, look at the one minute and 10 second mark. And then I'll look at that and say, oh, here's how they did that. And I could tell you the techniques for that as well. So yes, you can all schedule time to try and talk to me during the day or, you know, a little bit at night. Okay, good. Oh, and most importantly, um, I mentioned this with someone else. Make sure your ideas are original. Like, don't do Star Wars attack of the sneakers or something like that. You can't use pre-existing branding. So come up with your own movie idea or movie title. You could be inspired by other people's art design or motion or effects, but you can't use copyrighted pre-existing materials. Yeah, no problem at all, Jack. Mm-hmm. I knew you'd like that. Oh, I just caught uh, what you did with your play on your name. That's actually pretty funny. Ah, uh, yes, no, none of that. Uh, yeah, that's what I would, I would love it if you wrote me at three o'clock in the morning. And remember, um, I changed it. Focus on one solid animation. That's about 10 to 15 seconds. It can be either a title animation or a credit sequence. And I'm going to send this in the chat because, well, it's a shame that you're all up that late at night because, you know, there's a lot of sleeping to be done. One second, I'm going to mute my mic while I find this. Okay, I'm back. Uh, do you have any more examples? I don't Oh, yeah, yeah, I just sent you one. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So I was recently watching the Netflix. That wasn't me. That was someone else. Um, I was watching the Netflix show Lock and Key. And if you take a look at that title sequence, that is something you could do in After Effects. And a lot of you will already recognize like trim pads and then animating in a fill. Um, and it's really just very polished, confidently executed. Um, and there's great texturing, great art style. And this is something that you all could do. And um, the neat thing about the show is they change the intro motion graphics based upon what happened in the previous episode. So it's sort of like a previously on, but done through motion design. It's, it's, it's beautifully done. Um, I recommend you at least check out that one little link I sent you. And that's just a sample of one of the intros to the show. So that's a, a new sample. And I really like that one. Um, that's an example of a title sequence rather than a character. Um, what was I saying? A credit sequence. Well, let me double check it again. One second. Because I didn't watch it. I, it shows the title at the end. So it is the title sequence. But you could also have characters names popping up and make it a slash like credit sequence slash title sequence. I'm cool with that. But that hopefully helps inspire some of you. And I know you could do something like this because I showed you all of these techniques. It's just someone handling it very competently and taking their time with how things are moving. 
and coming in with their animation hierarchy. This is actually a very good tip for those of you who are still on when you're using blurs in After Effects, because you'll see a lot of these credit sequences. It's not just motion blurs and things like that. They put artistic blurs like you would use in Photoshop and you can animate the blurs over time. Um, but some of these blurs will take an unbelievable amount of time to render, okay? So watch your render time. Like, don't fall in love with something before you render it. Do a little test and, you know, render it off your machine. Like, um, put it up at uh, full preview resolution and just hit the space bar and see how long it takes to render because blurs can really slow you down. Uh, the more complex the blur, the slower it's going to take to process it. Um, tell you what, why don't you take a picture of them with your phone, Carmen, and send me the JPEGs of it, because that'll be faster than redrawing it. If you drew it out by hand, like just getting it to me as quick as possible, I can get you some feedback. That's always the best way, um, rather than trying to digitize everything. And it's also the same if you have a written idea you could type up saying, um, you know, this text comes in and there's some texture on it and there's a blurry foreground and a shadowy figure. Like it could even be that just so I get an idea for it. So, like I said, um, you know, what? actually, I've said this before. Draw your idea first, show it to someone, then if they like it, then tighten it up in Illustrator. So just show me the drawings first, like save yourself the time rather than redrafting it in Illustrator. That's fine. Rough is fine. I can still get an idea for it. You know, it's, it's talk about the concept and getting an idea for it. That's the important part. I mean, you think that's extremely rough. Look at the, my character rigging example. It's like borderline Terrence and Philip. So, and I only did one limb just to show you the idea, but you could get as intricate with it as you wanted. Like you could do each section of the finger. So the fingertip would be parented to the middle part of the knuckle, which we parented to the part that meets up with the hand and that's going to get parented to the hand. I mean, you could do as many shapes as you want when you're character rigging things. It's just all up to you. Did it help with me showing you the breakdown of the limbs? Because puppet pinning might get a little bit uh, iffy there based upon your character. Okay. And then I read something here I was going to look into, but the chat's going so fast. Uh, Oh, yes, the instrumental music. I'm, I'm glad I reread what Carmen wrote. Okay, now this is crucial and I want everyone to listen and those that left, um, make sure you let them know or I'll just remind them on Wednesday, we lose what Eric say. Okay, um, yeah, cartoony, that's fine. Just watch your art style. Don't do it overly simplistic. Apply textures, have highlights and shadows, um, things of that nature. Okay, so for music, you gotta watch it with your music. And the reason you gotta watch it with the music is because if you put copyrighted music in your piece, it'll look and sound great, but anywhere you put it on social media, it'll get blocked and it won't be able to be shown. So it'll be really tough to show in your portfolio. So I'm going to put in the chat a link to where I get my free music from. Uh, I get it off YouTube and at least, you know, YouTube saying, yes, you can use this. So one second, I'll send you the link. Okay. So I just sent a link in the chat. And if you go to this link in a new window, the most important drop down you're going to see, it goes genre, mood, instrument, duration, attribution, go to attribution and choose attribution, not required because you don't want to accidentally leave out, um, crediting the composer when they demand that you do it. So if you do attribution, not required, you could just post it anywhere and you don't have to credit the author, uh, the creator. Mm hmm. Yes, you should thank me. It was very nice of me to send you that link. That was a great question. Royalty free music is the way to go, or you can make your own. I had a student do that for their final project last semester. And don't forget, you can move your render bars 
in your timeline so that you can focus in on your character's movement and well basically any of your movement without having to render the whole area. This way you can more quickly see how it's moving. And you can see that right foot is kicking out. So I would have to go through and find the frame of where the right foot kicks out. And it's this one right here. Oh, and Jade, a, another valuable thing to do before you start puppet pinning on um, when you've got your, your pins in, I always do a resting pose. Like you see right here, there's my pins. And if you select them all, copy and then put them forward in time. Then you have your character go back to the resting pose at the end when you're ready for it. And I didn't grab all the keyframes because I was lazy, but that's something to remember. When we go into uh, morphing letters, I'm going to remind everyone of that. Again, having a good, clean resting keyframe. For reference to go back to. See, now it's back to the resting pose again. It's just a matter of having a clean set of keyframes to copy and paste at the end. I'm reading Jack's question. Um, yes, there are ways around that. Uh, what you could do is, um, well, clearly I'll be able to hear it because you're going to submit your file to me through Google Drive. Everyone's homework is going through Google Drive, so I'll get it. Um, some employers will ask for a link to your work. And what you could do if you love copyrighted music that much, you could put your video in a Google Drive folder and share the link to the Google Drive folder. Um, you get you might get more eyeballs to your work if you put it on YouTube and share a YouTube link. Um, just because it's faster and easier for people reviewing your work when they've got to go through like a hundred applicants in a day. So um, I think Vimeo, don't quote me on that, Vimeo might also let you use copyrighted music, but um, if you're a project, you can do it. You know, I don't recommend it, but um, it'll just make it harder for you to show your work afterwards if, if you follow what I'm saying, because all the social media sites crack down on royalty uh, copyright music. And also remember, um, well, no, you don't have to really worry about lyrics and stuff like that, but definitely pay attention to fading out and fading in the music uh, this time because, you know, there's, it's just this one thing we're working on until the end of the semester. So I want it to be polished and looking its best. Also make sure the style of music you pick fits with the theme. Like if you're doing something light, colorful, and fun, you want some bright, upbeat music. If you're doing something horror-based, you're going to want some suspenseful, eerie music, things like that. Have it fit the aesthetics of your visual. I'll be back in a second. I'm going to go grab a little bit more water. One moment. All right, I'm back. Let's see what I missed in the chat. Or the volume on my mic is picking up some weird sound off in the distance, driving me up a wall. I'm 
And also don't forget toggle hold, which can be used creatively to do hard changes across time. Bear in mind the entirety of your scene, foreground, background, things moving in front of the imaginary camera. You want as much depth and interest in your scenes as possible. You really want to push this idea to the max. No other emails from anyone at the moment. And I saw some of Jade's artwork. It's coming along nicely. And also think about separating the face, uh, Jade, like the eyes and whatnot. So you can move the mouth and make the character blink, you know, raise the eyebrows, subtle stuff like that. And a reminder, since we've been out of class for so long, don't forget to click the collapse transformation you'll see it here in a second it's that gear right in the middle for each illustrator layer you import click it on so that the when you scale it up it stays looking good that is critical you want your artwork to look its best Again, get your storyboards to me and ideas as fast as possible. You can just write it up and email it to me. You can take photos of drawings you did with your phone. I am very open-minded into looking into it and I'll be able to help you push your ideas. And if you saw anything, like I said, send me a link and time code it saying, hey, look at the three minute mark. And you know, we're like three minute, 10 second mark and I'll look for it that way too. Because you can very quickly share ideas visually these days. Okay, and a reminder, you can use photos, you can use video, you can do drawings, you can use illustrator, text, whatever, but just make sure you put a lot of care and concern into every second of the animation to make it look its best. And remember, blending modes are a great way of pushing your ideas, adding some texture and some life to your animations. Feel free to play around with them. Good ones are uh, oh, fast and easy ones, screen will knock out the darkest parts of a texture or an image. 
Multiply does the opposite. It basically keeps the darker parts and accents the highlight ones. Those are two useful ones, as well as luminosity, where it's using the tonal value and keeping the colors beneath it. That's another fun one to mess around with. Then the rest of them are all just, you know, experimenting. But you see how this changed so dramatically just by putting that little bit of texture over it. And then picking a blending mode. It all depends upon the feel you want. Like whereas this one's a little bit subtle. So say I like this blending mode. Well then I would just do some color correcting. Like it were Photoshop. I could throw curves in on top of it. And then start pushing it. Seeing it's got to go darker, lighter. See, so going lighter, I'm seeing more texture with this blending mode. Whereas if I had a different blending mode, I'd see less of it. Right. Check now real fast. Rope me through there. Nope, no one through the nail yet. I've got a sample of some jacks. I mean uh jade stuff. Now also make sure, uh Jade, that the environments you put this in match the style of the character. That'll really help unify the way this looks. Did anyone find anything that inspired them that they want me to help break down for them? Because that's something I can do with the remainder of the time we've got. Oh, glitching? Oh, okay. Uh, glitching would be... You can do it with anything. Type, whatever. So, um, I'll make a new, what's it called? New composition. Okay. So basically the concept is, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start from scratch with this. So you got your type <clears throat> and you've got a solid layer. And the way the glitching works is use, let's try fractal noise first for this. Okay, so Gabby, do you remember when we did the water in class and we used a displacement map to make it look more organic? I also used displacement maps when I was showing um, Carmen how to do the fire. Okay, good. So what you do is you're going to use a displacement map and a lot of people use like a blocky one. Uh, what is it? Rocky, Max Spear... Subscale small pumps. Let's try Rocky just for the fun of it. Block. And basically, let's see if there's a way to do scale. Yeah, um, there's scales. Is there a non uniform scale for this or no? Yeah, okay, there's uniform and non uniform. So if I click this off, and theoretically, what a lot of them do is they glitch the sides of it like sideways let's shrink down the height of that and then okay so when you're using displacement maps remember white is 100% of something black will be 100% the opposite of that and mid gray will be 50% of the effect 
and I don't know how this is going to influence my animation. So first thing I do is I got to pre-compose this. That's always the first step. And I right click and don't forget to click the move all attributes button. So I've pre-composed it. Now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up that pre-comp. And well, before I do that, I'm going to go to the type. I'm going to hide this real fast. This is my type, and I'm going to put a displacement map on the type. It's right here, displacement map. Okay, and I'm going to choose under the displacement map layer the solid that we got. Okay, and you can just displace the horizontal displacement. Okay, Gabby, you could do it horizontally or vertically. It's all up to you. Um, but to really get this looking the way you want it to look. We do look at this, edit that, and a reminder of that is you simply click on the layer in the pre-comp that has the turbulent displace and click on the lock icon, okay? So when you go back to your main animation, you still have your settings here. So I can increase or decrease the brightness of the contrast and I can adjust my settings and then start to see how that's going to affect the animation. Pretend I say, okay, I like the way this looks. I can then go back to my thing. I clicked off the icon in order to see. this is on back here. It's on, that's off. Okay, fine. Why is it not displaying now? That's very peculiar. Okay, I just went off past the uh, playhead. That's all that happened. No big drama there. So I'm going to change my vertical to zero. So it's only glitching along the right and the side to side. And I could try different settings like luminescence instead of red. And you can of course animate this over time. So I just click that playhead. I'm gonna go back right there. Move forward a little bit. Go in the opposite direction. It's all up to you as the designer how much you want the glitch how frequently in every direction. But that's it in a nutshell. Uh, the concept is you make a displacement map and you choose if you want to glitch it horizontally or vertically. Okay? And you can look at other people's glitch tutorials who go into it in far greater detail. But the basic idea is to create a um, displacement map. And well, I should say fractal and then displacement map. So it's like right here where it's very glitched. I can go in here, turn this back on uh, for look at this, edit that. And then try a different fractal like that. See how quickly the look and feel changed just by changing my settings. See, I've got something far more polished and professional looking. Then I can increase my contrast. Now I'm seeing less of it. So if I decrease the contrast, I'm going to see more of it. And I just keep playing around until I get it looking the way that I like it. And then I go to brightness and I'm going to make it darker and see if that, no, that's too much. So if I make it lighter, I'll get less of a distress. Let's keep playing around until I get the look that's mine that I want. Mm-hmm. Oh, no problem. So let's see what this looks with the refined look to it. So you can distress it and glitch it as much as you like. You have complete control over that as the designer.
I could also see what happens if I animate the offset turbulence for this. So I'm going to go in here, click that off, and what I'm going to do is just for the fun of it, I'm going to animate the evolution. So it's going to be moving even when I'm not glitching the type. And then the offset turbulence right here. And I'm going to have it move sideways. Like that. Let's just see what that did just for fun and some experimentation. So it just pushes it a little bit more. You can keep experimenting, experimenting. That's what After Effects is all about. It's about trying new things. And just remember, anything with a stopwatch, you can animate it. You just need a minimum of two keyframes split by at least one frame apart with the change happening over time. That's that's um that's uh basically motion design and visual effects in a nutshell. It's just a matter of being patient and experimenting. That's actually pretty interesting when you visually move it up and down as well. And what I'll do in the um, chat, I'll send you a link to someone who's done some pretty interesting things with glitches. One moment. Okay, so I just put a link to a tutorial in there and I showed you the concept, you know, with less bells and whistles and the link that I sent you has a ton of bells and whistles on it. So it just shows you how you can take a glitch and push it further um, and just play around with that concept. But it is very easy to do. As you saw, I, I did this in just a matter of moments and it does preserve the alpha. So that's also another good thing. And then let me open up phone. Okay, so here's some green screen footage I shot of myself. And if I take that displacement map effect and I place it onto the pre comp green screen footage. see it's going to distort the video as well. And I'm just taking that displacement map and adjusting it <clears throat> to have it distort the video. same concept I'm just applying it differently oh I think technology is an amazing so Gabby that just illustrates how changing what your fractal looks like will also influence the look of your animation. That's why I showed you the horizontal stripes because glitches usually have that horizontal look but you can play around and try different things and get different results obviously. It's just all in how you experiment and try larger or smaller uh, fractals horizontally and non-uniformly scaling them, things like that. I'm going to check mail real quick. If anyone wrote me. A great, a great use of your uh, downtime, Jay, keeping your stuff moving forward. Um, also, make sure you get me a storyboard and an idea so I know what's going to be happening here. And don't forget the scale of the fractal 
plays a huge part in the distortion as well. But look at this edit that is the best way of seeing what is going to happen. And a reminder, you can put <clears throat> puppet pins on anything and they work best if there's alpha around them. And if it's not working that good, just pre-compose what you put them on first and then apply the puppet pins. No problem at all. Um, remember, just check the expansion around it and you should be pretty good. Okay, all right, good. Appreciate that. Yeah, definitely get me your ideas, any samples you see, cause you know, this way you can get the most out of your lab time. Okay, have a good night, stay safe. Everyone continue to work on your various projects and don't let the end of the semester creep up on you because you're gonna be working on everybody's projects and you know, motion design is very time consuming. Especially when you're just starting to learn it. <laughs>